of Pacific Enterprises. In 1988, we decided to assemble a corporate art collection for our new headquarters. And like over 1,500 other corporations, we believe it's important to support the arts. Our goal has been to create a balanced collection for our employees to enjoy and to live with on a day-to-day -day basis. With that in mind, we have chosen works in a wide range of styles. You'll find some pieces you will initially like, and you may even find a few that you don't. But what I have learned through the selection process is that you should let art grow on you. The more you look at an artwork, the more you will have an appreciation for the artist's intentions, as well as his or her thoughts and feelings. Most of the artists shown in this videotape have created works for particular locations in our new headquarters. For example, David Ireland is installing 14 separate pieces in the stairways between our floors. Sam Maloof, a renowned California woodworker, is making our boardroom table and chairs. And Ron Cooper, with his studio in Santa Fe, is creating a series of handsome pieces depicting artists in our collection. There were itinerant uh, portrait artists that traveled the country in the 1800s before the invention of the camera and uh, did this very thing, but they, they used paper and they actually cut out people's portraits from, you know, just by eye, winging it by eye. Anyway, here's a rough of head. You can see a rough portrait now, right? Well, this is Ed Moses, an artist for whom I've had profound respect for years. Getting to do this commission of all the people that I kind of grew up with or around has been real interesting. It's real interesting because now I'm using the heaviest material that I've ever used. Bronze per square inch or cubic inch yeah. is heavier than glass, which I've used in the past. It's heavier than resin, heavier than any material. But what I'm using it for is to define air. Hot, huh? A little bit. How do you focus someone onto this sort of wall that you're talking about? I and mean, it's a matter that the urethane, in some sense, is that is that it's 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 like the Demar varnish on a painting, or it's the acrylic, good morning, good uh, or morning. the glass. Good morning, you man, you get another kiss. Another one, Lois. Yeah, kind of see. Yeah, I, I know this is good. Good morning. I save a lot of things too that I think are uh, sometimes. You know, not what everyone wants, but when I sanded the floors in here, I saved all of the sawdust. This is uh, Mr. Gordon, and uh, I, had his, I had his 95th birthday here in, uh, let's see, 1979. He's not with us any longer, but he lived here for 10 years, and this is his birthday cake. So, yeah, so that birthday, that birthday cake is almost 10 years old. And uh, if we get hungry and you don't feel like I'm taking care of you, you know. Well, this is the biggest party I've ever had in my office. This, this is good. Um, maybe we should go down to work because the time will, will disappear. Here's the elevator lobby over here. And then here's the, you walk around it this way and then into, and the, go into the regular floor. Right. Right. You know, I see each unit being different. Yeah. And uh, what 
I've wanted to do is try to bring some light in a subtle kind of way, since there's no natural light, the stairwell has no light, so I'm thinking about maybe uh, playing with some idea of backlighting some of these units. This little combination is sort of a souvenir of uh, 500 Cap Street, because it's sort of the colors that are predominant here, the yellow walls and then the green, the gas chamber green, uh, <laughs> the uh, parish hall, but institutional green. But anyway, now, I was going to, I was going to tell you about this. All of my work has always had a feeling of large land masses from great distances. Recently, the work has taken on the same feeling only from an aerial perspective. Uh, Landsat photography or CSAT photography reflects a lot of the kind of things that I do. Uh, the grids uh, reinforce the mapping quality. In fact, in some of the more irregular pieces, uh, they were inspired by uh, a visit to JPL. and. The triangular shapes are, are actually the way some of these laser scan um, images come in. Being a, a, a native Southern Californian, uh, I'm involved in a lot of environmental issues. And I really felt that I wanted to use materials that were indigenous to the area and, uh, and kind of reflect uh, some of the uh, natural materials that uh, are found uh, in Southern California. And hopefully you get, you get your light condition, you get your formality, but you also get a sense of the landscape because the materials that are put into these pieces actually come out of the landscape. All of my work is related to the, the sky and the sea and that kind of transparent colored space. And this particular series started to build a, a piece for an interior space which would be like a fountain, but would not have any water. But one of the things I like about the glass is that it does, uh, especially when it's in large sections and, and thickness, it does look like what one might think of if you took a saw and cut up a big section of, of seawater. It has that same kind of watery feeling, but it objectifies that kind of feeling in a material which is not objectifiable in water. It's a poetic metaphor, perhaps. And curiously enough, the glass is a liquid as well as the water. I don't like it when people prescribe to me what art should be. Uh, and immediately, I think, in my perverse nature, I begin to try to find weak links in their reasoning. And quite often, the art I do is an attempt to find the weak link. And I, and I, I think art has to have the spirit of play about it, uh, and play in, in, in the best sense, uh, where you're, you're not thinking about making masterpieces, but you're just trying things out. And you might fail. And, but what you're failing at, you, nobody knows but you, and, and you don't even know until you see it. I mean, you, can, you, know, you, can, you can see kids doing things, and you know, they're very intent in getting it right. What that right is, you'll never know un until it's there. The piece of work is a, a kind of a home within a home. And this place is nice. Um, my effort was to make that comfortable, comfortable meaning more fun than boring. This is where I would like to stop and say, well, question mark, uh, what do you think it looks like? And of course, it looks like a. Uh, a hotel on the beach. Uh, and it also looks like something that would be made up of parts that come in a box and are just right for ages 6 to 12. It's a place 
that's on the way to other places. A large room that people can enter and then from which they find their way to the specific of the Pacific Enterprise. When I was asked to do the, the piece, and they said something about it being about Venice, I thought, wow, that's great, because I grew up there, and uh, I was really familiar with it. And whenever I go to Los Angeles, I go to Venice and I hang out. And so I have seen it from being away from it so many years. I've seen it change. And it sort of is like a microcosm of what's happened in a lot of areas. So. The thing that hasn't changed is performance. But somehow, when people go down to Venice, they're in costume, whatever that may be. And um, somehow, they're able to be actors or actresses. And there's some guy that's been there for years who seems like he has every kind of uh, fandangled stuff hanging off of him, and he juggles. And uh, he's, you know, they're like carny people. And in moving and weaving in and out of this are these people with their headphones on and the radios and on skateboards or roller skates. A wonderful aspect of doing these paintings is that the figure is bigger than myself. In a sense, I could walk into the painting. By being able to walk into a painting or having a figure either the same scale as you are or larger, it gave me, in a sense, permission to do anything I pleased. And in, so, like in the dream world, you're doing some pretty strange things. When artists paint light, like the Englishman Turner paints light, it's not the same as what I'm doing. I'm, I'm really not painting light, but more the idea of light, or somehow the notion that surrounds the concept of light. It's hard for me to paint a picture without using a word, so you see the word light in there, so sunlight, flashlight, spotlight, city lights, and in this sort of cold white highway strip that goes across the top of the two paintings, more or less set the stage for it. We are Christian Jones and Andrew Ginzel, and the work behind us is named Reliquae. A, uh, a reliquary is a container for something very precious. And uh, what we have sort of enshrined in this piece is a sphere. It's this perfect crystalline sphere that contains clear liquid. This sphere disintegrates into pieces and then reforms as if by magic. Just as much as the matter in the universe disintegrates and then reassembles itself in every instance over time. A sense of timing in the work is indicated by this hourglass, which is perpetually flowing. And just before it's about to, to run out, it will turn over. And then so it flows on. We're working with, with the, the tension of, of equilibrium, the balance of of opposites. I mean, how, how the coexistence of opposites and, and how they define each other. The brink of chaos, the dynamics of, of weight, of tides. But, the, the, but the, real, the real fragility of this sense of equilibrium, where the slightest gust of air can throw the whole world, metaphorically, off kilter. My work is, is all about the, the planet seen from, from outer space, that kind of perception of time and space. The rock always, for me, is a symbol of the Earth. And um, the pigment is actually Earth-based. It's clay material. It's, it's ground up rock. And that's the rock. And I started doing this because I wanted to use, I, I called them at the time, materia prima. I wanted to use the most elemental uh, materials I could find, and the earth itself, and then ground up earth. 
I'm using uh, the, the blue, the very intense blue metals and stone. And I'm using them very purposely in an alchemical way of manipulating the materials and the colors and geometry so that it, it's really about, it, it, it produces some kind of transformation. It's almost like you know, dust to dust using the pigment directly on the earth. And then I started using them as sculptures. And in this case, incorporating steel. Uh, and that's like a symbol of the horizon of the earth. And this becomes the emergence of, of the stone. My father uh, studied painting in Paris with Fernand Léger. He also studied in London at the Slade School, studied the Art Students League in New York, and had this, this influence that uh, has been passed down to me and I think to my son Kevin, who is also a sculptor. And the three of us have had a lot of interaction together, talking about art, what, looking at art together, going out on trips to uh, sketch together, to uh, uh, mostly it's the talking that, that really had something to do with, with the, the influence on each other. I think cubism and surrealism has been a major, the major forces uh, in the, the evolution of my work. The major influences besides my father, I would say, are uh, Picasso, David Smith, and Henry Moore. So I have thousands of metal drawings in my head right now of things that I want to do. A lot of little ideas come to me, like uh, here again on this chair, uh, this little crest here is like a little wave. Well then, what I did, I did the same thing here, see? I followed it through there. But um, I, um, I just don't have enough time in the day to make the things that I want to make. I, I do not use jigs. It's all just eyeball. And each one will be a tiny bit different, but that gives it uh, uh, a little bit of, uh, uh, oh, what is the word that I want to use? Uh, each chair is, uh, has its own characteristics. In this particular chair, it's cut out with a bandsaw. And you can see here, at this point here, it's only a half an inch thick. And uh, it makes for a wonderful setting. <clears throat> when you slide into the chair, it makes you draw back into the lower part where you're up against the spindles, and it gives you very good lower back support. about glass is really the blowing process that's what really infatuates me and I have never gotten tired of the possibilities of what you can do with a blowpipe there's just something about you know blowing this this human breath into this tube I mean I'm interested in letting the glass do sort of what it wants to do and taking advantage of the gravity and the centrifugal force and and these aspects and it's a very spontaneous medium if you let it be there's, it goes far beyond just skills. We gotta have a white lip wrap on this. Right, we are. Right, right there, down, down, rather down. Okay. Hit me right there on that joint okay. there. Yeah, that's what you need to do. It's not all the way in. I like working with people in a team, and it, you know, I probably would have picked some form of expression that would have allowed me to work with people, I think, no matter what it would have been. I would have been a, you know, a filmmaker or an architect or, it's just not my style, I suppose, to want to sit working in a studio alone all day long. And um, the teamwork, you know, not only, of course, did it allow me to, to make things that I couldn't have done alone, it, it gives me a lot of inspiration. Well, it's not man-made anymore at night. It's suddenly something that's natural. 
And it's something for, for which you have a reaction which is unequivocal because it's of, its, of its magnitude, because of its, of its magic. It's, it's the, same, uh, the same reaction I have to Los Angeles at night, from the air particularly, is the same feelings that I would have about, oh, um, the Grand Canyon maybe, or Yosemite, or any, m any number of natural wonders, which is unequivocal. The Emerald City and the Wizard of Oz, and there seemed to be something very appropriate about Los Angeles looking or else evoking that sensation of the Emerald City because of the fantasy of the place. So that was one part that I really wanted to keep, and that's what I hoped the painting would be, would sort of be the Emerald City, meaning something that was artifice, something that was um, fantasy-like, something that was real, meaning because it actually did look that way, and how bizarre, I've never seen it look that way. But then to have it as part of this sort of very, this sort of drama of L.A. I wish to thank all of the artists who have works in the Pacific Enterprises collection. Also, Susan Rush, our outstanding art consultant, and the members of the art committee who chose these works with such care. Have fun with the collection and enjoy those pieces that are special to you. Something where you group some circles, Flora. Take a look up, like in that upper right hand okay. corner. Uh -huh. and, and maybe make those circles out of several dots each. Here is a, a gift of someone who uh, did a tape and they edited out all of the things that they didn't want and gave me the proceeds of the, of the, the tape. This is a, was for, a, let's see what else is there.